Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. And uh, so initially, <clears throat> you guys might have noticed, we, we kind of changed the topics a little bit on you here. But uh, the, I, I feel like that this topic would be really informative. It's a large topic. Obviously, when we start going through this, you'll realize how big array of information this is. But I tried to hold it in and really uh, pick up some things that are, that are key that might really help you in practice and point out some of the, the most common things that we'll, we'll see in the gastrointestinal tract. When we start talking about the GI tract, there are a lot of components to it. Um, the big ones that we'll hit on tonight is going to is going to include the oral cavity, uh, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and then our large intestine, which is going to be made up by the cecum and the colon. If if you're really trying to make an all-inclusive list, whoop, hang on just a second. Before you make an all-inclusive list, things like the anus, anal sac, liver, pancreas, all of these things truly could be included in the digestive tract because it really is going to take a, a huge number of organs and, uh, and tissue to, to involve um, with the digestion of our food. But the ones in reds are what we're going to hit on and we're going to start at the top and work our way to the, the bottom. So starting out we'll talk about the oral cavity. We start looking at the oral cavity and I'll want to do this with each one of the sections tonight. Uh, give you kind of an, a little idea of, of what the percentages are with all of these tumors and, and some of the, the signal men and predispositions that we might see. Um, when we look at the oral cavity, it makes up about 6 to 7 percent of all the canine cancers that we see uh, on a yearly basis. And it makes up about 3 percent of all the feline cancers we see on a yearly basis. One very common theme that you will pick up tonight as we're, as we're going through is that in dogs there is a male sex predispos predisposition or predilection in many, many, many parts of the digestive tract. You'll see it with oral cavity, you'll see it with stomach, you'll see it with esophagus, you'll see it with small intestine, large intestine. Actually males just simply have a, an increased incidence of uh, digestive tract tumors. I guess that's going to do that every time. So um, in dogs, it's going to be about two and a half times greater. <clears throat> the most common breeds that we're going to run into are going to be Cocker Spaniel, German Shepherd, uh, Pointers. And then over here, these are going to be probably the, the more common ones I see. Goldens, Poodles, Chows, Boxers, those are going to make up a lot of the oral cavity tumors we see. We start to make a list of the most common down to the, the, less, the less common tumors. In cats, by far and away, the number one oral tumor that we see is, is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. That's going to be followed by fibrosarx. And then when, when you look at the third most likely tumor, for me, it's lymphoma. Um, I, I just feel that melanomas in cats are really rare. But depending on what uh, paper you read and, and what reference you're using, you will see melanoma listed as a number three or number four tumor in cats. Uh, in dogs, melanoma is going to move right to the top. It is by far and away the most common malignant tumor that we see in the mouth in, in dogs. Um, squamous cell, fibrosarc will be two and three. And then down at the bottom, the more lower grade or benign tumors are going to be apulides. And I'm, I'm going to mention a little bit about those here. When we start with the most common tumor in the, in the dog, malignant melanoma, again, this common theme that I was telling you, male sex predisposition. The average age or the mean age for dogs is, is old. It's about 11 years old. Most common breeds that, that we see or that are, uh, that are listed uh, are going to be Cocker Spaniel, Poodle, um, Shepherd, Setter, Chows, Retrievers. One dog that doesn't make this list that I personally feel should always be on the melanoma list is going to be a Schnauzer, a miniature Schnauzer or even, or even giant Schnauzer, standard Schnauzer. These, these guys are going to be common. I mean, I do see a lot of miniature Schnauzers with, with oral melanomas. Oral melanomas are, are pretty tough tumors. I mean, they're highly invasive tumors. They have a lot of uh, growth really fast, a lot of bone destruction. Uh, not only are they locally aggressive, they do metastasize pretty readily to the lungs and lymph nodes. So the metastatic rate on a melanoma is somewhere around 80%, 80, 85 percent. Now this is going to be dependent on a couple different things. Location, size of the tumor are the two big ones. You'll see stage thrown in there. Location, further caudal, you'll, you'll find these in the oral cavity, so around the base of the tongue, around the tonsil area, really the, the, the caudal aspects of the maxilla. Those tumors seem to be more aggressive. Now, some of that is because you have an increased blood supply around the base of that tongue. You have an increased blood supply around the tonsil area. Uh, it's going to allow these cells to get into the bloodstream and kind of get swept out and move out to the other parts of the body. 
Some of that also is, is I think that these tumors are diagnosed a lot later in their stage of disease, later in their, their disease course. So when you have a tumor in the very front of the mouth and you open your mouth and the dog licks you, you're going to see it when it's sitting back in its tonsil area. You're probably not going to know it's there until it gets large enough that you smell it or you start to see some discharge or dysphagia. So that's why we see a, a little bit of an increased metastatic rate with those tumors. Every now and then you may get a report from a pathologist that says that you have biopsied a tumor in the mouth and it is a low grade or quote unquote even benign melanoma in the mouth. Uh, this is a truly, truly a pathologist thing. I, I do not think that many oncologists will agree that such thing exists. Most malignant, most melanomas in the mouth, if not all melanomas in the mouth, carry a fairly malignant behavior. Either they're going to be locally destructive or, or highly, in, uh, highly metastatic or both. The, there are a few, and certainly when you see melanomas near the hair aspect in the mouth, those mucocutaneous junctions, I do, think, I do think some of those will carry a little bit more benign behavior and tend to be kind of on that scale of some of the melanomas we see on the skin. Skin melanomas, haired skin melanomas, totally different disease. Those guys are going to be less aggressive, metastatic rates pretty low, fairly, fairly well controlled with just surgical removal. When it gets in the mouth, I treat all of those as malignant and, until proven, quite frankly, otherwise. About a third of the melanoma cases we see will be amelanotic melanomas. So amelanotic just simply means that these cells are, are so high grade, they're being produced at such a rapid rate that they have not had a chance to go through kind of uh, their, their proper maturation process. They're not differentiated enough to pick up that pigmentation that characterizes a lot of our melanoma cells or, or melanocytes. So when you have an amelanotic melanoma, it just means it's a more aggressive tumor. It means it's a more poorly differentiated or anaplastic tumor. So you may see something listed as anaplastic sarcoma on your report or undifferentiated sarcoma on your report because melanoma cells often do carry kind of a mesenchymal appearance. And with the lack of that pigmentation, it's really hard for a pathologist to call it. The significance of this really starts to come into play when we consider therapy. Are we going to remove this tumor and follow with chemo? Or are we going to remove this tumor and follow with something like the melanoma vaccine, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Obviously, the vaccine is tailored for melanoma. So if we're trying to determine, is this a melanotic melanoma or is this an undifferentiated fibrosarc, you're really going to try to start to lean towards your IHC or immunohistochemistries. There are a lot of different stains you can do for melanomas. My primary one that I go with is melanin A. So melanin A has probably the best sensitivity to pick up a, an amelanotic melanoma. So when I get a big aggressive tumor in the mouth that comes back as anaplastic, then I might, well, I might consider in those cases to do melanin A to just to determine is this a sarcoma or is this a melanoma. So. Um, Kind of moving forward, that's going to tell you a lot about the most common tumor in a dog. Or in a dog, when we look at cats, it's going to be an oral squamous cell carcinoma. It's the most common tumor in a cat. The second most common tumor in a dog. Very different in how they behave. Uh, an oral squamous cell in a dog is is locally invasive, but it has just a moderate bone destruction. Metastatic rates very low, 15, 20 percent for squames and dogs, and these are often controlled. We catch them at a little bit of an earlier, an earlier rate. Hopefully, we're able to go in, and do an aggressive surgery, remove that tumor and associated bone that's, that's associated with the tumor, and, and those guys can go on and do very well without having to have adjunctive chemo or adjunctive therapy. Cats are way different. Cats have a much more aggressive tumor. It causes a lot of bone destruction. The metastatic rate is going to be higher in a cat, 40% or so, to the lungs, to the lymph nodes. And it's very challenging to really control those tumors with a local excision. A lot of it is because they are so destructive and invasive. Cats will typically, even though they do have that high metastatic rate, in most cases they'll typically succumb to just local disease. So I get the question all the time about <clears throat> why are they so bad in cats and, and not so aggressive in dogs. And, and there is some information out there to help describe this. This may be something that you guys have heard of. It may be something new. Cats with squamous cell carcinoma cell or cat, uh, cells that from feline squamous cell carcinomas have been evaluated pretty extensively in the last couple of years. And one of the things that we now know is that squamous cell carcinomas in cats actually express parathyroid hormone related protein. In many cases, this PTHRP has been shown to be upregulated and expressed by squamous cells in cats. 
Now, we think about this with tumors like lymphoma and anal sac and causing hypercalcemia. One of the things we know now is that this particular hormone can actually cause a lot of softening of the bone and allow these tumors to be more invasive. What PTH does normally in our body is it causes bone reabsorption or calcium reabsorption from our bone, mobilizes that calcium and puts it in our bloodstream. So when you're making it inappropriate from a tumor, it can pull that calcium out of that bone, allow that bone to be weakened and allow the tumor to be more destructive on our bone and more invasive. So this is one hypothesis, at least right now, that we think is out there for why some of these tumors can become so invasive in a short period of time. Um, invade that surrounding tissue. And, and I actually have seen several cats that are hypercalcemia, or have hypercalcemia, are showing some elevation in calcium when they have squames. The next part is, is something you'll see as we go through the talk. I am going to kind of throw out some risk factors. There's always the questions. Whenever you come to these discussions or these talks, a lot of, a lot of what I try to do is give you something that might help you in practice. I get questions all the time, and I think you'll get more and more of them over the next few years about is this caused from blank? Is this caused from this? Has it ever been shown to be caused from this? And, and what I'm going to try to do is give you information that has been shown to either not cause the tumor or cause the tumor, so just known risk factors for cancer of the, of the digestive tract. A lot, of, a lot of research has been done, like I said, in squames, and there are a few things that have been described over the years to, that, that might be a, a, an increased risk factor for cats in developing these oral tumors. Um, I, I can't say that I'll 100% agree with all of these, but, I, but I, I certainly want to give you what's out there. So one study did show that you had a three and a half time increased risk if you were a cat that had a flea collar. Uh, if you used a flea collar, there was a three and a half times elevated risk of that cat developing some kind of oral tumor, and in that study it was oral squamous cell carcinoma. Another increased risk factor was canned food only diets, and, and a lot of those cats were eating just canned tuna diets. The argument with that study, I will tell you, is that there's just very common for cats to get squames, and it's very common for cats to eat canned food. So is that truly a risk factor or just a link? Um, but the, f the last one I do think there is some legitimacy to. So there was a two-fold increased uh, risk factor noted in cats that came from households with smoke exposure. In humans, the, one of the more common tumors that develops when you're exposed to smoking, smokeless tobacco, is going to be an oral squamous cell carcinoma, pharyngeal squamous cell, or even esophageal squamous cell. So squamous cell carcinoma has been known to be a, a common tumor in smokers and humans. And the reason that is is because of a mutation in their tumor suppressor gene P53 that allows uh, tumors to grow at a more rapid rate. We have looked at that in feline squamous cell carcinomas and, and certainly in households that have smoke, those cats, those squames that come from those cats had an upregulation in a mutated P53 expression and so that certainly is similar to what we see in humans and so it would lean some legitimacy that potentially the same process was going on as what we see in people who smoke. So kind of a scary thing because you may be around someone who smokes and, and, and just like the cats are getting secondhand exposure but that's, that's something that was noted and it was a, a two-fold increased risk. So, that's what's out there for oral squames. Um, there's not a lot of other things that have ever been shown to be linked to oral tumors in cats or dogs, uh, but those are the risk factors that we know have been reported. Fibrosarcoma is the second most common in the cat and the third most common in the dog. Again, that real common male sex predisposition has been noted. Uh, goldens and laboratory retrievers are the most common. The reason I bring this one up is some of you certainly may have heard of this. In 1998, they uh, did a study and looked at uh, a lot of these fibrosarcomas that seemed to behave a lot more aggressive clinically than what their histopath was really uh, showing. So a lot of clinicians would see these tumors and they came in and they were growing really fast, they were really invasive, they were causing a lot of problems. They said, man, this is going to be a hot tumor, it's going to be a bad tumor. And they biopsy it, send it to the lab and the pathologist say, that's a fibroma. You know, that's a low, low grade fibrosarcoma. And everyone said, no, that can't be right. This thing is growing like as I look at it. So the clinical behavior of these tumors are aggressive the, the rap, with rapid growth in bone invasion, but the histopath showed a more low-grade appearance. Well, this was termed a, low, uh, a high-low or a histologically low-grade, biologically high-grade fibrosarcoma. 
what is thought is happening here is, is if we take a tumor and we look at it, on a day-to-day -day basis, these tumor cells are reproducing rapidly. They say you make 20 tumor cells in a day as they reproduce. There is a normal death rate that occurs, though. You will lose five or six cells, seven or eight cells for every 20 you make. So you may net, you know, somewhere around 15 out of the 20. Well, in these low, these, these histologically low-grade tumors, that's, that theory is that these guys are just not losing very many. What is produced, they maintain, and so when they make 20, they hang on to 20. And so instead of them growing at the rate that we think they're growing, they're growing at a faster rate. So some of our histologic mitosis indexes and things that, that allow us to classify them as high, intermediate, and low may not fit because it's taken into consideration some of that, that normal death that happens among cancer cells. So with these tumors, they maintain a lot of their cells when they produce them. They get big quick, and they certainly become more aggressive and invasive than what might be shown on their histopath. The bulk of this, and the reason I bring it up is because if you biopsy one of these and you get fibroma or, or low-gate fibrosarc, you need to know about this because that means we don't sit on it. We need to kind of keep moving forward and go ahead and try to get that tumor out of there because he may certainly behave a lot more aggressive than what you, what you think he will. So when I get fibroma or low grade, I still treat it aggressively. I still get in there and talk, talk to these owners about trying to get that tumor out of there. The metastatic rate for an oral fibrosarc is, is not really high. It's about 30%, so kind of still one of those tumors that we can get in, locally remove, and, and get a lot of time for the, the dog. The last thing I'm going to mention is apulides. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to add this because I feel like maybe one of the last times I get to say apulides or epulis because they're changing the names of these things. I think every few years, like you guys know, they, they get bored and pathologists and everybody just change names and stuff. So this is, this is what's happening right now. There are three main apulides that you'll find out there when you biopsy some of these. Acanthomatous, fibrominous, and ossifying. And these are just proliferations, again, of some of the, the periodontal or, or surrounding dental tissue. The two terms, fibrominous and ossifying, there has actually uh, been identified a fourth apulity where there's a combination of fibrous and uh, bony tissue. And uh, when they found that, they said, you know what, let's just throw these names out and let's just call anything that looks fibrous and ossifying or a combination of the two peripheral ontogenic fibroma. And so you may get a report when you biopsy it that has this long name on there and you're wondering what it is. It's an ontogenic fibroma is just an epulis. Uh, but you may certainly start to see that term more commonly than fibro, fibrous epulis or, or an ossifying apulidae. It's That's the term that they're starting to switch over to use. Acanthomonas ameliablastoma is an acanthomonas epulis. That has been starting to work its way into the pathology reports more and more. But I just bring this up. Um, most of these tumors are very locally aggressive with time. They'll get bigger and bigger. They definitely can cause some problems. But the metastatic rate is low to non-existent. And some reports, they say that there's never been a, a, an amelioblastoma that metastasized. And then you'll always find someone that swears they've seen one that has. But uh, they will get big. I've seen some of these that are pretty impressive. I mean, they'll, they'll come in and they'll be very large. And, and so I wouldn't necessarily classify them as truly, quote, unquote, benign, but I say that they are low grade and can be treated with surgery and dogs can do really well with them. Uh, if you ever have one of these that's just not surgical, there is some, uh, some options for that. I've treated a couple of these with injecting them with locally with chemotherapy. We use the drug bleomycin and there are certainly some good reports out there defining how to do that. Um, we just inject the tumors every week or two with bleomycin. It's just a chemotherapy agent and I've seen some pretty good reduction in the tumors and stabilization of the tumors and so um, th there's some other options if surgery is just not a good choice. Most of the time we do like to do surgery because they do cause a lot of bone destruction so even with the bleomycin you may have an ulcer, you may have weakness of the mandible, you may have certainly a lot still r remaining bone destruction there so it, uh, it's more of a palliative measure, I guess you would say, than a true definitive treatment measure. Working up an, uh, an oral cavity tumor, minimal database, just a CBC chem urinalysis. Uh, you're not really looking for anything too, too particular there. Um, chest radiographs are important. As we talked about with melanomas, I mean, me the metastatic rate is very high, 80, 85%. So it's good to get that. 
Uh, oral radiographs, I, I do get those. I mean, we, we still take them. Um, people still take them. Certainly, I think it's, it's fine to do because you can definitely get an idea of what, how much bone destruction is going on. In my opinion, I mean, you just have to take them under anesthesia. I mean, you're going to be, you're going to hate life if you try to do it any other way. Um, usually, we try to go after four views, an open mouth, intraoral, oblique, and a, a VD or DV view. And then, it, it, you know, you're really just looking for soft tissue swelling, bone destruction, bone destruction being the big one. By far and away, the optimal way to image one of these is going to be with advanced imaging, CT, MRI. My favorite CT, CT with the bone density, the soft tissue density, and then adding contrast to this guy when you do the CT just gives you a really nice image. You can make nice small slices to the skull, and it works great not just to determine bone involvement, but it gives you a good idea of the tumor extent. Is it extending under the tongue? Is it extending back rost or sending rostrally or caudally, and, and to what extent? And it really gives you an idea, is surgery an option? And then if so, what's our planning going to look like when we go in and try to take this out? So CT is, is certainly something I encourage with any of these big oral tumors. Regional lymph node evaluation. This is, this is something I thought I was good at. I mean, I thought that, that certainly I could feel a lymph node and tell you if it's involved, and then I read this paper. Um, lymph node size for melanomas in this paper turned out to be really not very helpful. So in this paper, they took 100 dogs with oral melanomas, really good study that was done. 40% of the dogs with normal side lymph nodes were positive. And about 50% of the dogs that had big lymph nodes were just reactive. So that told me that I've got a sample. I mean, if we're looking at going in to do a big surgery, if we're looking to try to determine can we get rid of this tumor and definitively help this guy, we need to know if that lymph node's involved because if it is, we're probably going to try to take it at the time of surgery. If it's not involved, then we might not. But the lymph node, to know if it's positive, you're going to have to aspirate it. So, um, again, pretty remarkable study. 40% of normals were positive. 50% of enlarged ones were actually negative. So those are, those are some clear statistics there, and that paper was a really good one. When we start to look at local disease, surgery and radiation are obviously going to be our two big local therapies. With melanomas and squames and fibrosarcs in a dog, we usually try to go about two centimeters um, with these tumors if possible. The associated bone removal is pretty much a must. The, the example I always use with clients, and it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a so-so example, but I always talk about if you get one of those things at the store, buy something at the store, it's got a price tag on it, you try to peel the price tag off, and you leave all the sticky stuff behind. That's kind of what happens when you peel one of these tumors out of the mouth, is you're going to leave a bunch of stuff stuck behind on that bone. So you really have to take anything that's touching. You're going to have to take that associated bone, and, and, and that is to just, really prevent reoccurrence in a slow period, in a, in a very quick period of time, that is. When we start talking about feline tumors, fibrosarcs, two centimeters, squames, they actually define that being greater than two centimeters, two to three. Now, most of you have been inside a cat's mouth and looked at it. it. You just don't have that anatomy unless we're doing a complete hemimandibulectomy or maxillectomy on one of these guys. It's very difficult, or the tumor is just very small. It's very difficult for us to get anything near those margins. And this is what makes some of these squames so challenging to treat. I totally stole these pictures out of a book. Um, this is from uh, it, this is from uh, Withrow and McEwen's Small Animal Oncology book. It's it's certainly the, the book I feel is the best one out there in in, in veterinary medicine for oncology. Uh, really, I wanted to show you some some different you know some some, some really just different pro approaches and procedures when we go after this and, and just highlight some of the you know the ones that that seem to do really well. The first two here, the unilateral rostral and bilateral rostral, this is all maxillectomies. I mean, those guys can do very well. We see, cat, or see dogs excuse me, that have oral squames up front. We can take those off. And, and certainly that, that approach is a, is a very cosmetic one, and dogs can do real well with it. Um, the lateral maxillary gets a little bit more tricky. The, the, the palatine lesion in the back where they're going bilateral, it, it's, I don't know. Trey can probably give you more information about that. I don't. I don't see that done much in the maxilla. Um, it just it's going to increase our risk there of some oral nasal fistulas and some issues in in that area. But the ones in the front can do extremely well. Same thing when we start talking about mandibulectomies, um, rostral mandibulectomies, the, the unilateral and bilaterals do great. Uh, you may start to see a tongue that looks a little too long. They highlight that. The other thing that I would prepare you for if we do a, a bilateral rostral is 
in the dog, in a person, in a cat. You do have a little bit of a, <clears throat> a cup that forms here in your mouth where saliva kind of pools as we're talking, as we're eating, as you're just every day and sits here behind your teeth. And that keeps it from just, just dripping straight out of your mouth. Um, and then we swallow and, you, and dogs swallow. So when you take that off, now you just kind of have a slope that just runs straight out. You don't have that cup to pocket that saliva. So you will see a lot of increased drooling with some of these guys. And, and it's, it's hard to avoid that. Um, we just did one. He has increased drooling. The owners are 100% satisfied with him, though. He's a golden. He said, it's really, you just really know it when you go out and play and come back in. But if they're in the house and relaxed, you know, it's not a big issue. But it's, it's little things like that you don't think a whole lot about, but it's there. And so that was the biggest side effect for them was just salivation. And, and like I said, it's, it's not anything too huge. The vertical ramus that they talk about here, that's really going to be focused on just chondromas or, or MLOs, multilobular osteochondrosarcomas. Those are going to be more isolated tumors right there to that TMJ joint. Not really done a whole lot for big malignant tumors. Um, our most common one there, when we start to see anything that's involving a fairly large extent of that lateral mandible, is going to be a hemimandibulectomy, a, a unilateral complete hemimandibulectomy. Those are going to be the best ones for, for a lot of these aggressive tumors. Um, they just have a really, in my opinion, even though it's, it's a big surgery, they have a really good outcome, really good cosmesis. Dogs do extraordinarily well with it. We have a cat right now that Dr. Roach did that, that did a hemimandibulectomy. We were a little bit nervous about him at first. It, was, it had a lot of drift, the, the mandible moving over. I just saw him yesterday. Cat is just doing awesome. Like I mean, I can't, I can't even be be happier with him because the honestly the the owner, you know, he was nervous about it, but now the cat is just playing with stuff. The, the mandible's not moving. He's got more muscle built up on that side, and and overall, it looks like this guy's going to do real well. Those are tough, though. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, I wouldn't say that every cat that comes in should get one of those because you know that it, it is a little bit of a a. I guess to put it, you put it the right way, you've got to have the right client for it. You know, you've got to have the understanding that this could go really well or we might not want to eat a whole lot after we do this procedure. Um, dogs are different. Dogs do, I just, in my opinion, they do, they do great. Uh, good cosmesis, good function, and you're going to get good tumor control in, in the right tumors. The one that you will get asked a lot about is the last one, segmental, where you're going in and you're removing a segment of the mandible out, leaving maybe a little bit more rostry, a little bit more caudally. There, there is an indication for this, but when we start talking about real malignant tumors, it's frowned upon a little bit. And some of it is because of the medullary cavity that's in the mandible. You have an open canal that sits in there where you have an artery, a vein, a nerve. And tumors can certainly crawl along that. And you may not visually see that when you go to surgery. So, so taking one of those segments out, uh, a lot of times I kind of talk to owners about that. I said, we really want to get good control of this and ensure that we're going to have good control. We should lean more towards a complete hemi. And so the, uh, the segmentals are done, I, I, get, I think in the big scheme of things, you've got to make sure it's a little bit of a more lower grade tumor, um, maybe an epulis, uh, maybe a, a lower grade squame, but melanomas, things like that, if we're really trying to get complete local excision, it's going to be hard to do it in that, with that fashion. So, and I, that's twisted, but the, uh, again, I didn't make this chart, obviously. The, the, but I think it's a great chart. That's why I stole it, because it is such a good chart. The, uh, this, this just really summarizes stuff really nice for you. So if we look at the top, the top is, is mandible, the bottom is maxilla. It gives us a nice reading of our melanomas, squames, fibros. There's some osteosarc stuff thrown in here, and then even an apulidae there. And it gives you some time frames to quote when, you, when we're looking at it. With melanomas, it says 7 to 17, and these are some various papers. I mean, we've pulled a bunch of papers to put that together. So 7 to 17 on the mandible, 5 to 10 on the maxilla. Um, you know, honestly, we're shooting for, we're shooting for a year with these, with these melanomas when we go in and take them out and we give them um, the melanoma vaccine after the fact. When we start to talk about squames, squames can do real well, and this is all in dogs, by the way. Um, squamous cells on the mandible can get up there close to two years. Uh, on the maxilla, we see one there at 19 months, real strong numbers with, with surgical excision. Fibrosarcs are both going to hover right around a year with surgical excision. Uh, the osteosarcs are, are more variable. I'll just tell you, you can go six months or you can go a year and a half. It just depends on what kind of excision you're getting there and involvement. And then as you can see, the melioblastoma, sky's the limit, two years to five years. It just depends on, you know, on the age of the dog and the involvement. 
But to, but the take home thing there is is they're strong numbers. I mean, oral tumors in dogs are strong numbers. Uh, you know, melanomas are going to be the most challenging. And I think when you get good excision and you follow them with adjunctive therapy, uh, those dogs can still get out there and get some time. So. After surgery, uh, there are certainly some of these tumors that we do adjunctive therapy on. The big one's going to be melanoma, has the highest met rate. We use immunotherapy for melanomas nowadays, and that drug is called Oncept, or the melanoma vaccine. Kind of give you a little bit of information about what the melanoma vaccine is when we do it. Uh, it is actually a DNA-formulated vaccine. It is actually the very first therapeutic vaccine ever used to treat cancer, and that is in animals or humans. So this, was, this happened first in dogs. That is our claim to fame that we'll get to kind of tout for a long time. We did this before people did. Um, the vaccine is basically made to stimulate the immune system. The way it works is it targets and recognizes a cancer-associated protein called tyrosinase. Now, tyrosinase is found in both normal melanocytes as well as melanoma cells. But the way they do is they, they transcript a non-canine gene tyrosinase, murine, a murine, mouse uh, tyrosinase, into a small ring of canine DNA, uh, DNA and that actually uh, is foreign enough and uh, not self enough that it doesn't set up a tumor in the dog, but it stimulates, but foreign enough that it stimulates the immune system to recognize this tyrosinase in both melanocytes and malignant melanoma cells inducing a pretty strong and active immune response reaction and they're moving forward targeting the targeting these new melanoma cells that are, are developing in the body and hopefully eliminating them so it is a it is a more biologically um, molecular biology level I guess a more advanced therapy uh, it's showing some really good response I think one day you will see this in your in your clinics as well right now it's really localized just for oncologists and and the reason that is is because it was put on the shelf so quick FDA approved it and there were some stipulations on how it had to be used when it was approved so oncologists are using it for a few years here getting the information getting some statistics making sure it's safe and then I think one day they'll cut it loose and we'll see it you know more commonly used on a day-to-day -day basis um, the vaccine I can say the nice things about it is it is incredibly safe. So zero side effects. The only side effects that you'll see reported in many cases is a, is a red dot at the, at the application site. Um, these are injected with the typical air injectors like you'd see with some of the other feline vaccines that are out there, not given with a, not given with a needle injection. It's given once every two weeks for four total treatments, so it takes about six weeks to give it. Um, you do four treatments once every two weeks, and, uh, and then you'll booster the vaccine six months down the road with a single shot. And so it's, a, it's a very benign, very easy. There's not any side effects, no vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, or low white blood cell count, anything like that. And it's, it's, it works. It works well. Um, to give you an idea how it works, this is, this is what they quote. This is what the papers will show you. With adequate surgical uh, surgery or local control, we go in, we remove the tumor, and we follow with the vaccine. Whether if you see across the bottom here, whether you have a stage two, a three, or a four, four being that you have a big tumor that 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 was really involved, we got good surgical excision on it or good local control. We follow with the vaccine. The median survival time is 389 days. That's a big number for melanomas because years ago we were hovering more like six to nine months, and now this is exceeding one year. So. In my opinion, it's strong. In my opinion, it's a great therapy, and, and certainly I think in a lot of dogs we can, uh, we can get a lot of benefit from it. Uh, there are times when it doesn't work, and there are times when you shouldn't use it, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But if we get good local control, it's a great option for us. In terms of other things that are used to treat oral tumors, uh, NSAIDs like Proxicam, Carprofen, Meloxicam, etc., are used to really target Oh, COX-2, cyclooxygenase 2 uh, overexpression. I use a lot of Proxicam in cats for squames, but the reality of it is is that statistics and, and, and the research doesn't really support it a whole lot. Uh, in, cats that, in cats, they've not shown that there's an overexpression of cyclooxygenase 2 in, our, in feline squamous cell carcinoma cells. Um, what we do know is in canine oral squamous cells that they are. There is an overexpression of COX-2, and when you treat them with proxicam, carprofen, meloxicam, they can have increased control, they ha can have increased survival time, and they can have increased benefits from their chemotherapy. 
The take home point for this, I guess I would say, is that I usually do start with an NSAID when we're talking about oral squames because it pulls inflammation down, it gives them some analgesia. I like to think in the back of my mind it's slowing the tumor down as well. But if I have a cat that just stops eating, is not doing well, the inflammation is more than maybe the Proxicam's handling, or they're not handling it well, then I will stop it for a few days and start them on PRED. And I think that it's just to get the inflammation down, get their appetite up, and a lot of that's just quality of life measures for some of these guys, knowing how aggressive the disease is. In dogs, I try to, I try to keep them on the inset because there's just more research and more to support that it's causing a lot more benefits there than, than maybe something like PRED would. The chemo drugs we jump to for oral tumors, the big two tumors I'll treat in a dog are ARCAD, or squamous cell, and melanoma. Carboplatin is going to be the drug that we use in a lot of these cases in both of those tumors. Uh, second generation platinum, uh, it's less nephrotoxic to cisplatin and it can be given to a cat. Cisplatin obviously cannot be given to a cat, it's fatal for cats. So with squames and cats, we'll try to lean more towards carboplatin. Uh, neutropenia is dose limiting toxicity. When do you use it? Well, in cats where we're, we're trying to palliate the disease, we're, we're trying to do it in conjunction to slow the tumor down, give these guys more time, shrink the tumor, I lean to carbo. Melanoma, uh, you definitely will use carbo for melanomas in one really particular situation. And that is if you get a guy that comes in, you take x-rays and you see pulmonary metastasis in this, in this dog, or we have a tumor that we're just not able to control. The reason is is because the vaccine is a true vaccine. You give an initial vaccine and then you booster it three times. To get the immune system stimulated enough to recognize tyrosinase and get that immune response, you're actually going to have to get to about the third or fourth administration of that vaccine before the immune system is ramped up enough that it can have a response. That is scientifically proven. They have actually done immuno studies on these dogs and shown that in the lab their immune system is not competent until the third or fourth vaccine. So the problem with that is you're going to be a month to six weeks down the road and if this guy's got pulmonary mets in a month to six weeks, he's going to have a lot of pulmonary mets. And so you don't you don't want to sit on those guys. That's where we have to come in and give them chemo, even in, either in conjunction with the vaccine or in place of the vaccine, because I need something that works today, not six weeks from now. So with melanoma, when it's metastatic, unfortunately, that's when we're heading to the vaccine, or we're heading away from the vaccine and heading to chemo. Um, so the two big places, I think, in complement or local therapy in any of these big aggressive tumors, or in the case of metastatic disease of melanomas, that's when I'm going to be leaning more towards the, the chemo side of things. Radiation therapy, you have definitive and palliative when surgery is not an option. Um, quite frankly, the, the canine and feline tumors in the mouth are radio resistant. Melanomas are just notorious to be, to be fairly radio resistant, yet we radiate a lot of them because of, of lack of other options if they can't go to surgery. You can utilize palliative RT, that's my favorite, and that's going to be doing somewhere around two to six doses to the primary tumor or any kind of regional lymph node that might be involved. It will have an increased response. So as I put on here, it's going to have some apoptosis to neoplastic cells. It's going to have some anti-inflammatory effects. You're going to use somewhere around two to four treatments. It's about six to 10 gray, and you're going to see about a 75% of our patients have pain palliation. The downside to it is it's probably going to last and work for about two to four months. Um, it can be repeated, but again, just something to keep in your mind. Palliative radiation is truly that. It's palliating the tumor in the mouth, making the patient more comfortable, allowing them to eat, get some better quality of life. But, but radiation is going to be used when, when really surgery is not a good option for us. Uh, the last slide here I mentioned, and, and I promise the oral cavity is the longest, the others are a lot shorter. I always say they're going to think, wow, this is going to take forever. The, uh, uh, the RT, when we use RT a lot in squames in cats, and I, I just kind of put this bleb here, I think when we have cats, we treat them with RT and we add in carbo, and by RT, I mean usually these cats were given anywhere from two to four doses of radiation, just trying to slow that tumor down. I see these guys get out about four to six months. Um, that's that's going to be our, our survival time I talk to clients about. Usually we're talking about quality of life measures. Uh, I, I always have the, the owners start to keep a little bit of a journal when they're going through with cats with squames and just say, you know, I want you to classify this as a good day or a bad day. She ate well today. She didn't eat well today. She seemed like that she was uncomfortable and not socializing with us because cats are going to kind of tell you as that tumor progresses. Uh, but, but I think you can get them some time. We can get out there four to six months, and you know, if, I always say if, if we started right now with one, we might be next year before, first of the year before we lose them. So 
it is it is treatable. It's just a, it's a tough disease. It's probably one of the tougher diseases we see. Okay, so we finally get out of the oral cavity, and we're gonna move into the esophagus. So so moving our way down, we go into the esophagus now. <clears throat> esophageal tumors are much more rare. They make up only about 0.5% of the cancers we see in canines and feline patients. But they are pretty common in, in humans. Uh, they account for about 7,000 human deaths per year. There are, we go into these risk factors as I was telling you about earlier. There are some influences in humans that are known risk factors for uh, esophageal tumors. One of them are going to be industrial areas. So there, there's been studies showing that if you live in an industrial area or work around an industrial environment, work in an in a, in a industrial park or live in an industrial park, you're going to be exposed to environmental influences that can lead to uh, esophageal, increased risk of esophageal and stomach tumors. Tobacco use, this is smoking and smoke less tobacco has been linked to esophageal tumors. Hot food has been linked, and these are cases where we have trauma to the esophagus, so a burn or some kind of severe irritation with hot food. So that has been linked to esophageal cancers. And then the last one is parasitic, is spiral circa lupa has been reported to lead to sarcoma development in dogs. So that is a known cause, and that, and that has been studied extensively. Other uh, noted tumors we'll say, but the most common one that you'll see is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. That is in humans and that is in dogs and cats. So esophageal tumors are really squames. Squames are going to be the most common. That is occurring from that lining, from that squamous cell that lines the esophagus. Lyomyosarcomas, the muscular aspect, fibrosarcomas, osteosarcs. Osteosarcs have been reported in the esophagus, strange enough, and this is, this is metaplasia from soft tissues converted into a neoplastic uh, tumor. Plasma cytomas, and the last one is lyomyomas. Um, you can also get paraesophageal tumors. So paraesophageal tumors is where you just basically have an external tumor invading into your esophagus. Thymus, thyroid, heart-based tumors, like uh, anything from a hangiosarc to a chemodectoma can invade and put pressure on the esophagus. The most common one, though, and again, you're, if there's 0.5%, are going to be those top two, squamous cell and lyomyosarcoma. Those are going to be the two big ones there we see. Locally invasive tumors, obviously, they're going to be a space occupying a mass effect that's sitting there taking up room in the esophagus. They can metastasize to lymph nodes and lungs. Not real common, though. Um, actually, it's, it's been reported just as much to see extension, direct extension into regional sites where some of these tumors invade through the wall or the esophagus perforates and the cells just translocate over and stick to the lung, the pleura, the, the, uh, the, the um, thoracic wall, and, and turn into secondary tumors. Clinical signs you're going to see because it's just taking up a space in the esophagus is going to be dysphagia, weight loss, regurgitation, aspiration, pneumonia can all happen. And then there's the last one here. So hypertrophic osteopathy, or HO, has definitely been reported. We see that in dogs with pulmonary tumors, primary, large primary lung tumors. But there are two other places in the dog where we can see HO develop from a tumor. Um, one of them is going to be obviously the lungs. The second is going to, or the, the the main one everybody knows is the lungs. The other two are going to be the esophagus, which has been reported in about three or four different cases, and the kidney. So if you have a large kidney tumor, you have a large esophageal tumor, or you have a large pulmonary tumor, you can get HO or hypertrophic osteopathy. The reason we think all those occur is really, and, and this is totally hypothesis because uh, no one really knows for sure but but the reason we think and a lot of people think that occurs is from changes in um, vascular supply changes in blood flow changes in neurologic stimulation going to those limbs so the kidney obviously has a large amount of blood going to it we have a tumor growing there that may be a change in some of our vascular supply and, and vascular flow esophageal and and primary lung tumors as well can cause some changes there in neurologic stimulation along the esophagus with the big nerves running down the esophagus and the, uh, and the pulmonary masses as well can change some of the nerve and vascular innervation. So that may be more of a trivia thing, but it's something interesting to know. Surgical resection is going to be something that is going to come right to the top of the list when we start talking about treating these tumors. Success on, on treating an esophageal tumor really depends on the location of the tumor and the tumor type. Take home message from the esophageal section is, is that it's not a death sentence, I'll tell you that, because some of these dogs can actually do very well. 
if you have a low-grade leiomyosarcoma or leiomyoma, those tumors can be marginally excised, they can be peeled out of there, and those dogs can actually do really, really well and have some really good outcomes, exceeding a year. I mean, you can go in there and take these tumors out and these guys can do well. Location-wise, that's the kind of the tumor type we like to see. Location-wise, if you have a tumor sitting in the very caudal aspect of the esophagus near the, the gastric cardia, uh, you can remove that tumor and extend the stomach through the diaphragm attaching it to the esophagus. That gastric advancement can take the place of that void that you just removed from the esophagus and allow for removal. The problem with that is you will see increased gastric reflux because now you've moved the, you've changed how the, the stomach and the esophagus are associated and, and basically created somewhat of a, a hiatal hernia there, but it is an option for some of these tumors that are large and obstructing. When we talk about the last one, I'll just tell you, and, and Trey's going to give me a hard time about this, but uh, this is just this is more of a, a, an interesting thing. It's, it's something I think it's always cool to learn about what's out there, but this is rare. So not it's not something that's commonly done. Uh, you'll have trouble finding reports on this. It is done in humans. This is definitely done in humans um, to treat esophageal cancer because it's much more common in, in humans with smoking and smokeless tobacco. It has been done in a dog. It, it was done in Japan in a dog. But this is called a microvascular transfer. So removing a large segment of the esophagus and replacing it with part of your colon or your small intestine has been done in humans and has been done in dogs. So it's kind of an interesting thing. It, it gives you an idea a little bit about where the world's going and kind of what science can do and medicine can do now. There's a lot of limited info in, in patients, but this kind of gives you an idea of the different surgery options and, and what people are doing out there. Radiation therapy, <clears throat> when you have a tumor that's sitting somewhere that can't be removed, like the cervical esophagus, this is where we start to think about radiation. So just like with thyroid tumors, we can do radiation for carcinomas of the esophagus, especially when it's in the cervical region. Usually this is going to be a palliative course. You're going to do anywhere from two to six doses, try to shrink that tumor down, allow these guys to swallow, eat, and get on and, and have a good quality of life. There is certainly a lot of reduced tolerance to radiation in the surrounding tissues, so we can't go kind of full bore and do definitive radiation in your, in your esophagus. It's going to cause a lot of irritation. It's, going to, it's basically like getting a sunburn inside your esophagus when we start to push it too hard. So palliation is going to be the direction we go. Um, and, and I've seen some dogs that are treated with radiation for esophageal tumors in the cervical region. They do well. Uh, you're going to see some shrinkage, some improvement. Usually it's two or four months out. You got to make sure there's not a lot of swelling around the time of doing the doing the radiation, but but certainly can provide an option uh, when you're starting to, to diagnose some in some tough to, uh, tough locations for surgery. Chemotherapy, there's limited limited statistics. I mean, you remember how how few of these tumors are seen. I have I said personal experience, and it's n of one. Uh, we treated a dog. I treated a dog with a squamous cell in the esophagus with carboplatin. Had somewhat of a response. It's kind of stabilized the tumor. Followed it with doxorubicin. Again, kept it stable. The, the, the dog went on and did pretty well for about three or four months. Um, he was on an NSAID, and then we ended up stopping from just difficulty swallowing. He wasn't eating any mu at much, and he was really gagging a lot. So that was a quality of life issue. I think if we see some of these, for certainly it's not wrong to try. I mean, you're going to get we're we'll trying to get them a few months here, make them feel better, and shrink the tumor down. Drugs like Palladia, Tocirinib, that's out there right now, might be an option for these these guys as well as a as a chemotherapy solution. Just limited again, a limited information for us to to talk about. The prognosis, um, honestly, is is pretty poor long term with most of these tumors, except. When we start to talk about leiomyomas and leiomyosarcomas, there is a study that was published looking at esophageal sarcomas. Again, this kind of goes back to what I was telling you about I'm doing well. This study had six dogs in it. These were actually, they were actually looking at spiral circulupa in these guys because all of these dogs were, were the sarcomas were linked to spiral circa as the cause, but they were treated with an intrathoracic partial esophageal removal or peeling that tumor out of there, and the dogs did really well. The uh, Five of the dogs did get adjunctive doxorubicin to it, to the surgery, and the median survival time was 267 days. It's not uncommon for one of these guys to get out to a year uh, going in and removing it. So I think getting a diagnosis of what the tumor is, I mean, that can be done certainly with endoscopy. Um, you can get, a, get an idea, say, yeah, this is a sarcoma. Now we, now we can go in and 
try to remove that because that might be a beneficial tumor to treat. So if you see, ever see an esophageal tumor, um, just keep that in the back of your mind as, uh, as a prognostic factor, a sarcoma. Moving into the stomach here, this is, this is going to run a lot, fairly similar to what we're seeing in the esophagus with a few, few, few small differences. It is still a rare cancer in dogs and cats. Uh, it, it's a little more common than that of the esophagus. It makes up about 1% of all the cancers we see in, in dogs and cats. In humans, again, it's, it's fairly common. It's up to sixth most common cause of cancer-related deaths in humans. So stomach cancer is certainly something that in men and women is a, is a big issue. In people, adenocarcinoma is going to be by far and away the most common type of tumor we see in the stomach. It's, uh, it makes up 90% of all the gastric cancers we see. You've got the same environmental influences that have been linked in humans as we talked about there with the esophagus. There are going to be a couple of things that are not on this list, um, and one in particular that I kind of highlight and uh, uh, for, for a couple of reasons, but one is you, you, hear, you hear sometimes this inappropriately thrown out there, but, but you'll notice that there, besides temperature in the food, environmental influence in humans is, is certainly not other types of food. Uh, red meat, things like that are not causing cancer of your stomach or your esophagus. Uh, you'll, we'll catch that as we move on down the gastrointestinal tract here in a minute. Um, alcohol is not also on that list. Sometimes people try to link that if you drink alcohol, you're going to get esophageal or stomach cancer, and it's, and it's been loosely linked in some studies, but not linked in other studies. So maybe if, maybe if you're drinking moonshine all the time, that, that might do something, but, but wine and beer is not going to, be, not going to make that list as, as causing significant gastric tumors. Um, when we start to talk about what we see in dogs, there is an increased incidence of stomach cancer in Belgian shepherds, and that will be repeated in multiple studies. If you have a Belgian shepherd, it's a rare, it's a rare tumor, but it, it is a, a tumor that we see in those, those dogs. The average age of a dog with a gastric tumor is about eight years, a little bit younger than some of the other cancers we see. And here's that male to female ratio again. Again, two and a half to one. So once again, males are making the kind of the top of the list there for gastric tumors. Uh, carcinoma <clears throat> is going to be more likely in actually in dogs in general uh, in the stomach and than lymphoma, and certainly more likely in males. The bottom one here, lyomyomas. Lyomyomas, you will run into some of these. We actually just saw one, what, last week? Last week we saw a lyomyoma, incidentally went in, did a splenectomy, found a little mass and thickening around the, the cardia of the stomach, biopsy that came back as a lyomyoma. It typically occurs in really old patients. Now this is a, if that's an average, that's an old average. I mean, I, I, when I saw that, I was like, was there like two dogs and one was 16 and one was 14? Or, But the, the uh, it, it is, this dog, surprisingly enough, we just did surgery on was, was 14 or 15. Uh, and so uh, again, an older dog. Uh, with something like this, this is kind of what we're doing with that dog. That dog is asymptomatic. It was an incidental finding. We're not gonna go back in and try to cut this thing out. Uh, it's an older dog, he's 14 or 15 years old, um, he's not symptomatic for it. Lyomyomas are slow growing tumors, they're not going to typically grow really fast and cause a big problem in a, in a short period of time. So <clears throat> with something like this, uh, we're going to treat that if it starts to become an issue, if it's not, we're going to kind of let it, let it alone and move on. So the, the uh, average though for a lyomyoma is, an, is a really old dog and, and if you ever run across a really old dog with a stomach tumor, that may be what we're dealing with. It may not necessarily be a real aggressive one. Tumors of the canine stomach, again, just like in humans, 90% 90, 90 in humans are carcinomas, adenocarcinomas. 70 to 80% in dogs are adenocarcinomas. So adenocarcinoma is definitely going to be your top differential in a dog. In a cat, it's going to be different. Cats are going to be lymphoma. Carcinoma is more rare than lymphoma in cat stomachs. Lymphoma is going to be the most common gastric tumor with adenocarcinoma being, adenocarcinoma being the most common uh, canine tumor. Other reported stomach tumors in dogs, of course, they can get lymphoma, lyomyos, gastrointestinal stromal tumors are just and I'm going to talk about that in more detail and kind of give you guys some ideas of what that actually is. Uh, a mast cell tumor can be seen. Typically, these are going to lean closer to the, the felines. We see more mast cell tumors in the, in the gastrointestinal tract in cats. Plasma cytoma and the final one there, fibrosarcs, have also been seen in the stomach. 
I wanted to kind of go over a little bit over GIST because some of you may or may not know this tumor. Um, gastrointestinal stromal tumors came from the human side. Um, it really started when we were diagnosing in humans uh, these Lyle myomas or Lyle myosarcomas, these, these muscular sarcomas or mesenchymal cell tumors, and noting that some of them were behaving a little bit different than what was initially anticipated a little different metastatic rate, a little different survival time, a little different behavior in general. And so we started doing some immunohistochemistries and, and looking to see is there a difference between them. And sure enough, they found it just basically instead of rising from a mature mesenchymal population, actually it comes from a multipotential, very early precursor stem cell called a call cell. Uh, cells of call is basically a, a very early precursor cell. If I was looking at a piece of intestine and we had the little villus and crypts, a cell of call is going to be located right down at the very bottom of that crypt and that's where cells basically originate initially and then they differentiate into becoming what they are, whether they're going to be smooth, tish, smooth muscle or they're going to be connective tissue. Um, but these are early precursor stem cells and that's what makes up this gastrointestinal intestinal stromal tumors. They occur most commonly in the cecum, but about 20% will occur in the stomach as well. How you classify a gist from a normal Lyle mild sarcoma because they look very similar is going to be with using, or using immunohistochemistry with a IHC stain called CD117. CD117 basically stains for a stem cell marker called CKIT. And CKIT is actually a little tyrosine kinase receptor where the stem cell or the, the, the uh, um, CKIT or stem cell factor binds to, promoting that differentiating, promoting the growth of that cell. CD17 just highlights that. This is the same stain that we can see when we stain for mast cell tumors looking for CKIT. You'll hear about them saying you should do this stain if you have a mast cell tumor. The significance of it is this last part. In humans now, we treat most GIFs when they're identified with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors because they have these known markers. They're going to take up that drug. That drug's going to block that, that factor, and it's going to hopefully, in, in all the best case scenarios, stop these cells from reproducing, stop these cells from differentiating into these GIST cells, these GIST cells excuse me, and, and the tumor's growing, slowing that growth, and hopefully inhibiting that growth over time. In dogs, if we identify a GIST, we can also do that same thing with now our tyrosine kinase inhibitors, tocirinib, mesitinib, and amitinib, or Gleevec, Pladia, Kinovet, and Gleevec. And so this is a, this is a new thing of, of tumors that we're seeing in the stomach, and we now have some new options in treating those when they're identified. If we run across some, this first part is what, if you were a pathologist, you would get if you were just looking at an H&E stain of a, a GIST versus Lao Mao. Both of them stain the same, they look the same, they have this nice little swirly mesenchymal population, and you're going to say, hey, that's, that's a sarcoma, and that's about all you could get. If you stain for CKID, if you stain for that, CT, uh, that CD117, you're going to get this real magenta, maroon appearance, um, brown appearance to the cells when you stain them positive, whereas when you stain the lyomal sarcomas, nothing happens because it's just highlighting that, that CKID receptor. So, <clears throat> again, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but I just wanted to highlight that tumor. Now, going back to just the behavior of stomach tumors in general, um, it's important to know which one of these metastasize and which one of these don't metastasize. Real easy way for you guys to remember that. 70 to 80% of tumors of the stomach are going to be adenocarcinoma in the dog, and 70 to 80% of adenocarcinomas in the dog are going to metastasize. So, that just tells us right there, when you get an adenocarcinoma, it's... it's pretty likely in a dog and it's pretty likely it's going to go around and move and do something uh, more aggressive by metastasize. Lymph nodes, liver and lungs are going to be the common ones. I see a lot of these tumors go over to the liver at some degree. Um, lymph nodes and lungs are going to, are going to fall in there in the close to second and third. And then there's that bottom one there that I listed. There are three separate reports of dogs that have gastric adenocarcinomas that metastasize to their testes. So. Uh, this has been confirmed. They actually take a piece of the tissue from the testes, they took a piece of the tissue from the stomach, and they did verify that it is truly metastasis and not necessarily uh, a different separate tumor. This just tells me that basically I, I kind of take all that information and, and learn from that, that that cancer can do really just whatever the hell it wants to do because that is super unusual for something like that to happen. And it's, been, and it's happened more than once. We've seen three separate case studies that have been published reporting a, a gastric adenocarcinoma going to the testes. 
So interesting, um, rare. Again, probably not a ton of a ton of useful information there besides just uh, just gee whiz stuff. Lymphoma in dogs and cats is also common. Obviously, lymphoma is the most common uh, gastric tumor um, in a cat, as I mentioned. These are not going to metastasize. These are just generally going to be systemic diseases. We treat most of those as systemic. If we do surgery and remove the mass and it's lymphoma or we get a diagnosis, we're going to treat those guys adjunctively with chemo because most of those do metastasize and move over to other parts of the intestines, the lymph nodes, liver, spleen. Uh, you're you're going to see that move around. Just that we just talked about, those are going to have about a 33% metastatic rate in the gastrointestinal tract. This is the highest metastatic rate for a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. As we move out and start to look at other areas and we see that tumor, it's going to behave a little bit more benign, um, but a 33% met rate. <clears throat> the big one you want to remember is the carcinoma, the adenocarcinoma in dogs, though. And then, of course, just knowing that lymphoma is a systemic disease for the most part. Diagnostics, is there some key things that you should kind of look out for? If you have a, if you have a gastric lyomyoma or lyomyosarcoma, you can see a perineoplastic hypoglycemia that has been published and has certainly been recognized in several dogs with that. So if something, you run some blood work and you see that, that is a tumor that can cause that. Anemia uh, can be seen with gastric ulceration. It's a microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities certainly can be identified from just chronic vomiting. Usually these stomach tumors are causing some mechanical outflow obstruction or some, just some changes, and vomiting is often a pretty common uh, presenting complaint. Thoracic radiographs, you're looking for metastasis, you're looking for something like over here in the corner, that's going to be that 70 to 80% that I was telling you with adenocarcinomas that met that you're looking for. Ultrasound is really our primary diagnostic as we start to uh, look for gastric tumors. They're going to, it's going to give you a good appearance that there's a mass effect associated with the stomach. Gastroscopy, which I put below it, actually is going to tell you even more about what's happening on the inside of the stomach. Both of them have pluses and minus to them. Both of them are very valuable tools and both of them also have some limitations that you just have to be aware of. I think with the ultrasound, it's, it's going to be our first option here because it's a, it's a less invasive procedure. You're able to do that without doing anesthesia. You can evaluate lymph nodes and liver and the GI tract and kind of look around and get a, put a clear overview of what's happening in that abdomen. Gastroscopy is going to allow you to go in, get a better idea of what's happening on the inside of that stomach. Is it ulcerating? What's the real picture of this look like without having to go to surgery? The limitations with gastroscopy is when we biopsy those tumors, um, you're going to have some increased false negatives. And, it's, and sometimes you get really good samples, you get your answer, and sometimes you don't. And it really because there's, there's various degrees of necrosis and inflammation and ulceration, and, and oftentimes those deep biopsies are going to be a little bit more diagnostic for us as we're, as we're trying to get an answer for what we're actually dealing with here. Positive and double contrast radiographs, pe people still do them. Um, it, it can certainly be done. You will definitely highlight if there's a tumor sitting there in a lot of cases. So I definitely still add it to my list as an option for us. But once we identify it, then I think we start moving back up and looking at that ultrasound to see what else is going on. Surgery. Surgery is going to be beneficial in, in, in two different scenarios. The first one is certainly going to be in getting that deep in, excision or excuse me incisional biopsy of the tumor, getting a diagnosis of what we're dealing with, and then certainly excisional um, by removing the tumor. Adenocarcinomas can really benefit, and, and really all those tumors can benefit from surgery. A lot of it is because it's just sitting in a spot that's just, just an unfortunate location regurgitation, uh, vomiting, those are things that are, that are going to happen from outflow obstruction, especially if those tumors are large and, and taking up a lot of space. Adenocarcinoma, you just have to remember, it's common and 70 to 80 percent of the time it'll met on you. Um, lyomyosarcomas, lyomyomas, they can do a lot better when we go in and excise those. The gist, you're going to fall down in that 30, that 30, 33 percent met rate. So the surgical excision on all of those can be real beneficial as well. Surgery is technically demanding. Um, it's really based on where the tumor is located, uh, how much involvement is happening, how debilitated this patient is. We've been vomiting for a month and this guy's electrolytes are all out of whack and the dog's just not doing well. Location, again, tumor involvement, those are, those are going to be big ones to talk about. These two procedures, I highlight them just because with any of these stomach surgeries, you've got to mention them. Um, this is an advanced surgery procedure to go in and remove them. These are when tumors are associated with the pylorus, uh, that, that distal aspect of the stomach. 
What you're looking at here, Bill Roth, this is, this is a Bill Roth one. Guy's name was Theodore Bill Roth, um, Polish surgeon identified and, and highlighted this procedure. Basically what it is is you're taking that, that, that pylorus aspect off where the mass was associated with it, outflow obstruction there. It may also be associated with that proximal duodenum. Um, this would be classified basically as a, a, du, a duodenal, or excuse me, a gastric duodenostomy. Um, it may require a biliary bypass depending on where the common bile duct is entering into that duodenum, but then you're resecting out that involved section and then anastomosing the duodenum to uh, the stomach. And these do have increased post-operative morbidity, um, and obviously you can see things as high as 20, 30, maybe even 40 percent morbidity after a procedure like this, depending on your biliary bypass and, and how much you've changed the normal anatomy there. You're changing outflow, you're changing where the, the common bile duct enters in some of these cases, and so obviously there's, there's a lot of things there that need to fall back into place for you to have normal function. A Bill Roth II is a different procedure. That is a gastrojejunostomy. The problem with this is that you are now attaching the jejunum as your outflowing small intestinal section, not your duodenum. The reason they do that is because in some tumors so much of the duodenum is involved that you're having to take such a large section of the duodenum out that now where it attaches down to this duodenal colic ligament, you're not able to extend the duodenal all the way up and attach it to the stomach. So you're having to rotate the jejunum around and use that as your attachment site. This is not done at, very commonly at all. It has a lot of post-operative morbidity. You obviously, when we start to talk about changing anatomy, this is changing anatomy right here. And so the, uh, the <coughs> procedure is done, though, in some cases. There are some good outcomes, but obviously it is, a, is what we would classify as a salvage procedure, where we're, we're taking a large section of stomach and, and dwelling them out and trying, to, and trying to get a normal flow. And I'm an oncologist talking about surgery, so I'm, you know, this is, you want to talk to these guys if you want the real details on that. So, um, but, but I think it's important to kind of know some of those ideas and, and what we think about when we look at these tumors. Uh, conventional chemotherapy, we're going to use that in a lot of these cases when we move away from surgery. Lymphoma is going to be treated typically with solo ther chemotherapy or in combination with surgical uh, debulking of the tumor. Uh, using you, typically with these guys, certainly in dogs, and even to some degree in cats, we're going to be using a CHOP-based protocol: cytoxin, doxorubicin, vincristine, and prednisone. Increased response has also been seen in a rescue setting with lamustine and pred. So lamustine and prednisone is also an option for chemotherapy in in dogs and in cats with lymphoma. Adenocarcinomas have a high metastatic rate, like I said, 70-80 percent. In the, the the stomach, small intestine, and colon. Whenever you have an adenocarcinoma, your chemotherapy choice changes as you move around in that, in that track. In the stomach, carboplatin seems to be our go-to drug. We just see an increased response with stomach carcinomas. Adenocarcinomas treated with carboplatin typically do a little bit better than those treated with docs. Every now and then we'll do a combination of the two, but we like carbo for stomach uh, carcinomas. The benefit there can, can be basically it has an increased response rate. The second benefit is that you can do it in an intracavitary fashion as well. It means I can inject, inject the chemo directly into the abdomen. That is done when you have an effusion, neoplastic effusion, uh, the, or carcinomatosis where you have direct transplanting of the carcinoma cells into the mesentery, the abdominal wall. The benefit with that is you're going to get a real high exposure of chemotherapy about three millimeters deep into those tissues, into those cells. You also get some of that drug picked up and circulated back into the venous supply. The negative to it is when you inject it into the, into the abdominal cavity is you're only getting about a two or three millimeter penetration into the, into the cells. So usually with these guys when I do it, I, I have a little formula that I calculate that I just kind of made up in how I'm doing it where I'm doing somewhere around 65%, 60% of my drug, depending on how much effusion is there, into the abdomen, and then I'm putting the other 40% into a catheter and putting it into the vein. And, and that allows me to kind of target this in two different directions. What goes in the abdomen will be reabsorbed to some extent. You'll get some penetration, but I don't think you should treat these guys with all of it into the abdomen. That's a lot of drug, and you're only going two or three millimeters, and so I feel like having splitting that and moving part of it into the vein is a good option. And I've seen some pretty good responses doing it that way. 
gist or those gastrointestinal stromal tumors, obviously when they're in the stomach, we start to lean more towards those CKID inhibitors, palladia, mitinib, mesitinib that I was telling you about. The prognosis for stomach tumors, uh, and this is a, many of these malignant gastric cancers, you're going to have guarded to poor prognosis, um, uh, high metastatic risk with carcinomas. If we go in and do surgery alone and we excise it out, it's going to be around six months median survival before it moves into one of those other areas, either reoccurring into the stomach, moving to the liver, lungs, lymph nodes. That can be extended if we're doing chemo like carbo. Um, I think that you certainly can get those guys out there closer to 10 months, maybe even a year, but that's probably realistic where we're going to be at with them. Gastric lymphoma in dogs is different. Obviously when we have multicentric lymphoma in dogs, big lymph nodes, liver, spleen, lots of involvement, we can still see some really good responses, really good survival times, getting out there a year plus. Gastric lymphomas, small intestinal lymphomas in dogs, they just they just struggle. They really do. Three to six month median survival time is what's quoted. I think it's real. I think that there are some dogs that do really well. I had a resident mate, the dog lived for 12 months with, with gastric lymphoma, but it was it, it's certainly not the norm. I usually talk to people about, we're going to go after this, we're going to do we can't, everything we can, but three to six months is, is something you got to start thinking about with lymphoma in dogs. Cats are going to be different. Dogs, that's, that's kind of the number. Lyomyosarcomas and GIST, they're going to bounce out there more like a year. Um, that can be with surgery or surgery slash chemo. So <clears throat> leaving the stomach, we roll into the small intestine now. This is going to take up the most room in the abdomen, being the largest kind of surface area that we're, we're dealing with. Small intestinal tumors in dogs account for about 6 to 8% of what we see in the cancer uh, situation. In cats, it's going to be up to 30%. So in cats, intestinal neoplasia, big, big deal. We see a lot of it. I see a lot of it every day. Mean age for cats is somewhere around 10 to 12. Mean age for dogs, somewhere around 6 to 9. Again, same deal. Uh, male over-increased representation in dogs and cats. You see these males get in a, a pretty, pretty tough road when it comes to the GI tract. Overrepresented breeds in dogs, shepherds, collies, Belgian Malinois um, are also listed on there. And then in cats, uh, Siamese cats with carcinomas have been overrepresented with in the small intestine. And I thought the last one was kind of uh, generic, but domestic short hairs have been listed on there for lymphoma. Um, so cats. So the, uh, uh, if we look at if we look at the um, stomach, carcinoma, is, as I said, is most common in dogs. It's the most common in people. Lymphoma, the most common in the stomach in cats. In the small intestine, and some people will debate this, but the small intestine. Cats and dogs, the most common tumor that we see at this point in time these days is lymphoma. So lymphoma is the most common tumor of both the dog and the cat in the small intestine. And that's what you're dealing with until we, we determine otherwise. Uh, second most common tumor kind of running on the heels certainly in, in dogs as well as in cats is going to be adenocarcinoma. And then you have the other reported small intestinal tumors that we were mentioning, Lyle Miles and GIST. Cats, number three on the cat is going to be mast cell tumor, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. You will see those. Dogs, you can see some unusual tumors like carcinoids or neuroendocrine tumors. These are going to be tumors like chemodectomas up in the thoracic cavity, adrenal tumors, some of the uh, pheochromocytomas. Um, those tumors are going to be deriving from some neuroendocrine tissue there in the, in the small intestine. Plasma cytomas as well as soft tissue osteosarcs and even hemangiosarcs have been reported in the small intestine. So what about risk factors? So again, people are going to ask you why their cat, there's 30% of cats out there potentially getting something like this. Why is their cat getting this disease? With exception to feline viral influences, which I'll talk about in just a second, there are no known environmental, chemical, or nutritional influences. Um, that on dogs or cats of the intestine. There are a lot of things that have been thrown out there, but not much that can be repeated and, and confirmed. In humans, um, there are a few risk factors. Red meat intake, salt-cured foods, fat intake, um, helicobacter, plus or minus, some people will say helicobacter can, uh, can cause uh, intestinal tumors, um, but we see a lot of people with helicobacter that certainly don't get uh, intestinal tumors. Tobacco and alcohol, they are not known risk factors in the small intestine. So um, good news for some people. There we go. The, uh, so, but, but red meat, salt-cured foods, fat intake, I'm probably in a lot of trouble. 
And then uh, we move into, you know, we move into kind of the, the back to the animals. I mean, if FELV and FIV are are risk factors, I mean, there, there's no question. Um, FELV positive cats are going to be a, a distinct population, though. Honestly, we don't see this disease much anymore in the cancer world. Um, these guys are going to be very young feline patients when they develop FLV lympho related lymphoma. If I have a cat that comes in that's super young, you know, three years old, two years old, four years old even, I might do FLV testing on them. It's just not something, I, I remember doing my residency, we tested almost all these cats for FLV, looking for it, and it was just, it was just not something that you would see unless they're just a distinct population. And you kind of know that cat when it comes in, you're like, wow, Oh, that's weird. That's a super young cat get, to get lymphoma. So most of the cats that I'm seeing nowadays, 10, 12, 11 years old, that's going to be the normal, the normal um, uh, uh, signalment. If a cat does have FELV, they do have a big time increased risk. So up to a 22-fold increase has been documented in cats that have FELV um, to develop something like lymphoma. It is certainly an increased risk with FIV, but nowhere near the same. FIV is more of an immune competence issue, and you're going to see an increased risk, but it's a more of a minor fashion, two-fold increased risk versus a, a cat that's FIV uh, negative. There is no risk, however, though, for non-lymphomatous cancers that's been reported with FELV or FIV positive patients. So FELV young cats, there is no question, has an increased risk 22-fold in one study. Um, FIV, there is an increased risk, but, but not super crazy, I mean two-fold. Small intestine lymphoma in dogs and cats. So, so what does that look like? <clears throat> we know that it, it's, it affects number one in cats and number two in, or number one in cats, number one in dogs. That's going to be the big one. Well, these lesions are usually diffuse, multifocal even, um, infiltrative. They're going to involve the submucosa, lamina propria, usually disturb your normal layering of your intestines. Mesenteric lymph nodes as well as viscera are often involved. That's real common either when you diagnose this or later in the stages. Up to 80% of dogs and cats will have some kind of systemic involvement. Mesenteric nodes are, are moving into other areas. In dogs, we typically have thought that the, t the disease we're treating is T-cell lymphoma in the GI tract. Maybe that's one of the reasons why it's more aggressive. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the prognosis is so much more guarded. In cats, we typically have considered that it's B-cell lymphoma. Um, to be honest with you, there's newer reports now saying B-cell equals T-cell. You get both. And, and so the, the logistic thing here, the, the really the big take home is, is we just really don't know what the prognostic significance of that is. You won't hear me really say much about testing a cat for B versus T cell markers because I, I really can't tell you how much different that's going to change things for what I do or what the prognosis is. Uh, and in dogs, we're going to treat it aggressively as we can. With, in, in T cell, I do think a lot of them are T cell. And so things like lomustine may be uh, increased efficacy there because that factor that it is that some of these dogs do have T cell lymphoma. What does change the prognosis, we may not know if, if B or T does in cats, is going to be whether a cat has large cell versus small cell lymphoma. So large cell versus small cell lymphoma, you'll hear that term thrown out all the time. What that is is, is, is really straightforward. When a cell is large on a cytologic appearance, it's more poorly differentiated. It's, it's had less time, it's went through less maturation, it's probably being produced at a much higher rate, so more cells are being produced in a shorter period of time. They're accumulating in that intestine, and they have a, a cytologically more undifferentiated, uh, abnormal precursor type appearance. When cells are small in appearance on cytology, they've had more time to go through maturation. They look more like a normal lymphocyte. They're being produced, therefore, at a slower rate, having the time to make it through that maturation. And therefore, in a, sh in a shorter period of time, you're just not going to see as many cells produced. This is probably why our prognosis and our efficacy at treating it is much different. With large cell lymphoma, they're being produced and pumped out so quick and have that big abnormal appearance, it's hard for me to get ahead of that disease. I come in with something like Lucaran, and PRED, I may not slow that disease down much because I knocked down 10, but 100 were made today. If you look at small cells, it's being produced at a slower rate and cells are maturing, so I, I'm able to step in with a lower grade chemo like Luke, Ran, and PRED, knock down 10, and maybe that was all it was produced today. And so you can slowly get ahead of it and see an improved response and a, and a better prognosis in these small cell cats versus these large cell. And, and I do, this is how I explain it when I talk to clients about large cell versus small cell. So 
<clears throat> the second most common intestinal cancer in dogs behind lymphoma and in cats is going to be adenocarcinoma. So dogs definitely have a potential for their adenocarcinomas to get large, involved, and certainly metastasize. In the stomach, we said 70, 80%. In, in the intestines, it's going to be closer to 50%. So 50% of carcinomas in the small intestine will metastasize. In cats, the rate is high as well. 50% of cats with carcinomas will go ahead and metastasize over to the lymph nodes. But probably the big one is that second one there. 30% of cats with carcinomas in their intestines will develop diffuse peritoneal carcinomatosis. That's a big deal. So now you're looking at this effusive neoplastic ascites. You've got the cells that have translocated over the abdominal wall, over to the viscera, and so causing a pretty diffuse involvement. And then the last one is 20% is, is of the cats will go up to the lungs, and you'll see metastasis in their lungs. So carcinomas, we know lymphoma is systemic. We know we're going to treat that with chemo. Carcinomas, you can go in, you can remove those tumors and get some benefit. But remembering those statistics starts to make us think we need to follow those guys with some kind of adjunctive therapy as well. And then I put this slide in about mast cell tumors for, for a couple reasons. One is, is it's, it's fairly uh, going to rank pretty high on the list for cats. Uh, it's the third most common intestinal tumor in cats. Mast cells, when you look at them, if you, if you go after one of these tumors or you start to think you may have a mast cell tumor in a cat, it's going to be fairly poorly granulated. It can be confused with just a, a eosinophilic enteritis, which throws you off because you're, now you're wondering, okay, well, wait a minute, am I supposed to be suppressing this guy or is this a tumor? Perforation can be seen a lot of times with these mast cell tumors, meaning they end up going in for surgery and having these tumors removed. And then usually, uh, in a lot of these cases, we do treat them with combination surgery and chemo. Unfortunately, they usually have a pretty poor overall survival time. So in one retrospective study of 25 cats, and I, and I, I mean, I read this study and I was like, wow, that's, that's crummy. 25 cats, the median survival time for those guys was two months. I've treated a couple of these guys. I've treated a couple of dogs with mast cells in their intestines. And, and I, you know, I, I guess my impression was they did a little better than that. But it was a good study. It was a clean study, 25 cats. So, so I know it's a, it's a tough one. I know it's a guarded prognosis when we get that diagnosis. Um, some of these tumors, if they're not perforated, you can aspirate them via ultrasound and, and get a pretty good sample, just like if you had a, a regular mast cell tumor, and you'll, you'll pick it out when we look at the cytology. So this is, when we see that, it, it is one that is a, is a guarded one. One, and I just wanted to mention it and bring it up and talk about it a little bit. So when we do diagnostics, you, you've got a small intestinal tumor. You're moving forward. You're saying, okay, I'm going to work this guy up, see what's going on. Hypereosinophilia, uh, we just talked about an eosinophilic enteritis. You can actually see a perineoplastic eosinophilia in the bloodstream with mast cell tumors as well as lymphoma. And this is in dogs and cats. And I've seen this. I mean, sometimes I don't know really what to do with it, but I do see it. And uh, it is actually due to an overproduction of immunoglobulin or IL-5. Um, it, it does increase the production of those eosinophils, and you'll see that spike on your, on your CBC. Again, anemia can be noted from gastric ulceration uh, in 40% of our cases in dogs. Elevated BUN, 15 to 70 percent in dogs and cats, and that's from some blood loss into the GI tract from ulcers. And then finally, a leukogram change, like a left shift, is noted in up to half the dogs and almost half the cats that, that are presented with these with these uh, intestinal tumors. Thoracic radiographs uh, definitely are needing to be done. You see the the met rate 50 percent with these carcinomas in in the intestines for dogs, especially if we're going to go to surgery on them. And certainly with cats, it can be as high as as, as 30, 20, 50 percent going different areas. Ultrasound again, going to jump in there being our primary diagnostic to look at most of these tumors. <clears throat> what are you looking for when you do an ultrasound? Well, everything. I mean, you're looking to see is it localized, multifocal, diffuse. Is this a tumor I'm taking out, or is this a tumor that's involving the entire small intestine? Lymph nodes involvement, liver involvement. You can certainly still, like we talked about with the mast cell disease and, and even lymphoma, those round cell populations will typically exfoliate. Some of the carcinoma populations will exfoliate for you, so aspiration via ultrasound is, is real beneficial for a lot of the intestinal masses or even the lymph nodes. I will tell you I am a huge, huge believer in trying to get an aspirate from some of these dog intestinal masses and cat intestinal masses, but particular dog intestinal masses. When we start to get a diagnosis of a GIST or a leiomyosarcoma, that's a totally, totally different deal if we can get that answer before we go to surgery versus me saying your dog has uh, three to six months with lymphoma or your dog has a mast cell tumor and we're going to go in on surgery. So we, we do try to do an ultrasound and find out what we've got going on. 
differences there I guess I would bring up is is I mean if it's perforated we're going I mean we, we're going to have to go if we're going to if we're going to uh, do any good at all to try to get this tumor under control and get this guy feeling better um, really obstructing masses obviously those are going to probably move into surgery but if we're stable otherwise we'll try to get a sample uh, either with uh, endoscopy or, or with ultrasound ultrasound tells us a lot though and you know this is this is something some of you may know or not know but the Neoplastic versus non-neoplastic disease. I might not be able to tell you what the tumor type is, but we can look at ultrasound and get a really, really good gut feeling on whether this is a tumor or not. That is something that we need to go after or treat with, uh, you know, aggressively. 99% of neoplastic masses, and and this was this was actually in uh, in some dogs that were looked at. But 99% of neoplastic masses have loss of intestinal wall layering. It's huge. I mean, it means that if you see loss of intestinal wall layering, this, this is this is a tumor. Um, Eighty-eight to ninety percent of non-neoplastic GI masses will maintain that layer. You may have a really thick intestinal wall, but you're going to have some normal layering there. Be able to pick out that muscular and serosal and mucosal layers. So. In another study, same kind of scenario was supported. Dogs with loss of layering, 50 times more likely to have a tumor than have just enteritis. So loss of layering, when I see that, I'm having the cancer talk with these guys. Endoscopy, again, great tool to look at a lot of this stuff. You just, again, you know, I, I kind of go back to harp a little bit on some of the limitations. And it's not that I don't like endoscopy. I do. It's just, it's just really knowing what to talk to owners about it and what our, what our limitations and what our benefits are. It allows you to minimally invasive evaluate a lot of the intestines, not just biopsy one spot, but biopsy multiple spots. There's a lot of benefits there. Evaluate multiple areas, get a lot of non-invasive biopsies. But again, false negatives can certainly be seen with inflammation, irritation. Maybe this tumor is developing in that muscularis layer, uh, not in the mucosal layer. Maybe it's in the submucosal layer. Small samples just lead to limited tissue to evaluate. A good example was a study that was done here that showed that, that normal healthy dogs can sometimes be interpreted as tumors. And so these guys just took some laboratory beagles, did endoscopy on all of them, grabbed some samples, sent them to some pathologists, and 20% of them said that the dogs had tumors, and they didn't. You know, it was, just, it was just small samples. So some of that I will stress is user dependent. Uh, are you going in and just getting one sample and sending it in and calling it good? Or are you getting multiple, multiple samples, trying to get deeper samples, trying to be kind of diligent and take your time? And certainly our internists do a wonderful job at that. So you guys, uh, rest assured, we'll do our best. So it's just important to really try to get those samples because you want to give them a lot to look at. Those limited samples are, are really challenging. And, in some, and sometimes we can't. You know, sometimes we tell owners, you know, we, we, we just don't know. We didn't get a good sample. So full thickness biopsy here is needed. And so when we start talking about going to surgery and getting a, and getting a biopsy of this tumor, or even in some cases treating it presumptively, if we see a, 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 you know, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a cat, looks like lymphoma, that's probably what we're dealing with. We will have some cases where we might challenge it with LSPAR and just see if it responds. And if it does, then now we know we're dealing with, with lymphoma and most likely. Surgical Explorer, though, can provide a good, a good answer, get you a biopsy, get you a tumor diagnosis, allows you to visualize the organ, allows you to visualize the other abdominal viscera, allows you to biopsy the other abdominal viscera, uh, you get your full thickness intestinal biopsy. Um, pathologists have no, nothing to complain about. They've got a good sample to look at now. And if you have a bulky disease, an obstructing mass, a perforated mass, you're able to get that out of there and certainly make, some, and, and make a lot of benefit out of that surgery. Excision, uh, surgical excision is an option for a lot of these solid intestinal masses. So adenocarcinoma, as you can see here, even though it has that 50% mass uh, metastatic rate, if we look at a study and just say, what happens if I just take, take a mass out and we don't do anything after the fact, you're going to see a median survival time of 7 to 10 months. So you're going to get benefit even if you just went to surgery and removed it. Going after that with chemo after the fact, though, these dogs can benefit even more. We take that 50% met rate down to a much more manageable lower level, and now those guys are going to live hopefully out over a year with, with surgery and chemo together. Lyle Miles, they can do very similar, get out there several months. And then you run into this GIST guy again. So if we can confirm that that's a GIST, your prognosis just jumped enormous from from 10 months to a year out there now to 12 months to 30 months in some studies. So GIST can do well. I usually do still talk to these guys about going on some palladia if I get that diagnosis. But I think at the long term, these guys can, can really have some benefit from, from surgery. 
Mast cell tumors in dogs, again, kind of like the cats, not a really wonderful prognosis. Treat them with surgery, treat them with chemo afterwards in all cases with chemo. Two of 49 dogs in one study, two, uh, basically two out of 50, uh, lived longer than six months. Uh, but I still, we still go after it. We still try to treat them in dogs. I got a dog right now with a mast cell tumor we removed. We're treating him with chemo. He's doing awesome. I know the statistics, but he's doing awesome. So would I treat my own dog? Yes, I would. I mean, there, there's no question. I think that's, that, that these statistics are made up of two different aspects of a curve, and so some of them can do real well, and, and that's what we're looking for. But in cats and dogs, mast cell disease is a challenging one, and, and we have that discussion before we, before we go after it. If we're looking at <clears throat> feline intestinal tumors, I think we, you know, I read these statistics, and I, I read this one, and, and I pulled this paper and actually looked over it. Um, in my opinion, we do better than this. I mean, I, I don't like this statistic. I think we do better than it. This is what it says, though. Significant perioperative re, uh, risk with cats going after non-lymphoma tumors, adenocarcinomas, mast cell tumors, all of those guys. So 50% of cats in this study um, uh, that had non-lymphoma intestinal tumors will die within the first two weeks. I don't really want to quote that to anybody, um, and, and otherwise you're, you're going to be pretty slow on surgery. This is, you know, I, I just think we do better than this. I think we have a better population. We're picking out a better population of patients. We know that these numbers are out there. Uh, there there's, there's no real defining factor on, on what those patients look like. Did they have diffuse disease everywhere? Were they really debilitated patients? Obviously, those are the ones we're not going to jump right to surgery on. So. It, I think you, it's patient criteria, picking the right guys, making sure they're stable, having a good support staff, having a good anesthesist, you know, making sure we do the job we need to do and get the, get the mass out of there. But the guys who survived two weeks, I like this statistic, now you're seeing these guys jump out there six months to 15 months, and that's, that's, a, that, that's, that's starting to make you feel better about going to surgery. So, you know, it, it, feline intestinal tumors, when we get a diagnosis of lymphoma, um, we know the direction we're going. It's a systemic disease. We're treating them with chemo. When we're non-lymphoma tumors, we just have to, to kind of look at what we're dealing with, what we think we've got going on. Is this a carcinoma? And can we? And this guy going to handle surgery and get it out of there? Because if he can, he's probably going to have a, a good shot at, at going on and doing okay. When do I go to surgery on lymphoma? Uh, there's papers that say that lymphoma and surgery plus chemo does not do anything more than chemo alone. I kind of agree and kind of don't agree with that. So my, my impression is that certainly that some lymphoma cats can benefit from going to surgery and having a mass removed. The first two are without a doubt. A big obstructing mass, maybe it, we gave it one dose of L-spar, nothing happened, or a dose of chemo, nothing's happening. A perforated mass, that's a no-brainer, we're going to surgery. And then the last one, this is not reported, but I will guarantee you that this is real. Localized masses involving that distal small intestine. Sometimes you'll see these big small intestinal lymphoma masses around the, the ileum and the ileocecal-colic junction. Those guys can actually do real well. I, and, and I've had a couple of these that go in and have the mass removed. It looks like there's no real other areas that are involved. We take that section out. They turn around. They look a lot better. We might take them through a short course of chemo. But... Um, that that part is real. I seem like that I see some guys that go first go to surgery on those, and usually we're taking them out because it's obstructing. It's in that junction, and it, it may be causing some obstruction. But I feel like that if we looked at all those and we kind of gathered some cases up, it might show that, that these guys benefit from surgery. So I do think about it sometimes with those. Lymphoma in dogs uh, is going to be real similar to kind of what we talked about in the stomach. Treated with CHOP-based protocol, lomustine and PRED, again, we think it's a T-cell form. Uh, it seems to have some primary and rescue settings, has some benefits. Prognosis is going to be real similar to what we saw in the stomach, though, three to six months. Not as strong as we'd like it to be. Uh, I think that we still try to treat those guys. I've seen some big, I've seen some dogs with intestinal masses do really well. I got a dog right now that I'm treating. It's a little Yorkie. He is, he has gastrointestinal lymphoma. We've actually taken him through a couple protocols. He was diagnosed in December, and he, I saw him today, and he looks like a million bucks. And I mean, so, so they're, they're, those guys are out there. They do okay. They can do well. Uh, but, but the prognosis and, and what's reported is, is right there. Large cell intestinal lymphoma versus small, small cell intestinal lymphoma. If we look at how we treat them, large cell intestinal lymphoma, I'm treating like a dog. I'm treating with the CHOP-based multi-drug protocol. He's got a high-grade disease. He's not going to be controlled by Lucran and Pred. You're just, you, you can, but it's... Man, it's hard, and and you're going to see cells that are growing fast. You're going to see tumors that are that are moving quick. This cat's going to wax and wane, and just kind of be so-so. Maybe have some ups, maybe have some downs. 
you come in with a more CHOP-based protocol for lymphoblastic uh, feline intestinal lymphoma, you're going to see a bigger improvement. The disease is going to reduce. The guy's going to have a better quality of life. It, he's going to feel a lot better in a shorter period of time. When we treat these guys with chemotherapy, the median survival time for a cat is reported in, in a couple different scenarios, either 5 or 9 or 6 to 10. I usually quote somewhere around 6 to 9 months. I definitely see cats exceed 12 months. You know, my cat exceeded 12 months with lymphoma, uh, didn't do anything different, treated him with CHOP-based protocols. So, I mean, that is, that is kind of the direction I go. I, I just start treating these guys in the theory that they're, we're, we're acting like they're a dog and we're moving kind of forward with that same six-month protocol that you hear. Small intestinal, uh, small cell, excuse me, small cell intestinal lymphoma in cats, I think clarambucil and prednisone, lucran and prednisone is a great option, prednisone or prednisolone. These guys can, you can get ahead of it with that disease. You can treat these guys successfully. They can do well. Um, usually the prognosis with those guys are very good. If they have a good response, their disease is, reduces down. And basically, you don't have to keep doing ultrasounds. You may see a cat that just starts gaining weight, stops vomiting, stops having diarrhea, and you, you're feeling pretty good about what you're doing. So chlorimacil and pred is, is a good option for them. There is some scenarios where I will take a small cell lymphoma, though, and give him at least an induction of CHOP. Maybe we go four or six weeks with, with a Vink, Cytoxin, Doxorubicin, Vink, Cytoxin, Doxorubicin protocol, but some kind of induction. And that is really based on the degree of the disease. So we might get a diagnosis of small cell lymphoma, but on ultrasound, the liver's big, the spleen's big, he's got big lymph nodes, lots of areas in his GI tract that's involved. In those guys, I do like to try to get them induced and get the disease down to a manageable level, get it under control, get it knocked down, and then maybe alternate them over to the Lucran and Pred if you have a diagnosis of small cell. So it's not that every small cell lymphoma cat is exactly the same. That's the kind of the take home there. If you see one that's got minor disease, minor signs, you, you see get a thickened GI tract, maybe he's just having diarrhea chronically or vomiting off and on, you're probably okay going to Lucran and Pred. If you've got a guy that's lost a ton of weight, vomiting, has big lymph nodes on ultrasound, lots of disease, and you get an aspirate that comes back as lymphoma, small cell, I would consider putting them through a little bit of injection because I think that you can get some benefit in a short period of time. And most cats, if I look at dogs and cats, cats typically handle injectable chemo better than dogs. I mean, they do great with these, with these drugs. So you're not going to have a big negative there to try to, to try to induce them with something a little more aggressive on the front end. doesn't mean you're locked into that for six months. It means you can get them induced and then maybe alternate them back to small cell. So I have some of these cats that have come over and seen me. We've got them under control and I've turned them back over to their referring vet for, for just monitoring and treating with Lucaran and Pred because they're comfortable doing that. And that's totally an option for you guys down the road anytime. So looking at other chemotherapy options, I mean definitely we'll use chemo for adenocarcinoma or carcinomatosis cases. Um, Intracavitary therapy, we, we talked a little bit about that just a few minutes ago. <clears throat> with cats, 30% of these guys will develop carcinomatosis, so we can come in with something like carboplatin and do it intracavitary, same way that I was telling you about earlier. Cisplatin and 5-fluorouracil both have been reported in dogs to, to uh, um, be used in an intracavitary me measure. Do not give them to a cat. They're both fatal if you give them to cats. Uh, cisplatin will cause pulmonary edema. 5 fluor will cause uh, the fatal neurotoxicity. And when you do it intracavitary, same rules apply. It will be absorbed into the bloodstream and it will run the potential of killing the patient. So cats, you're okay doing carbo, uh, and, and certainly that's what I go with. But when I look at the canines, I mean, we have a few more options for them. Intravenous drugs, doxorubicin typically starts to show some better responses than carbo when we move out of the stomach and get into the small and large intestine. So now when I start to see adenocarcinomas in dogs in, and certainly in cats, I'll start to lean more towards using doxorubicin, getting doxorubicin into that protocol to some degree. Doxorubicin is just more effective in the small intestine versus carbo being more effective in the stomach. Limited numbers of cases on statistics on small intestine. We've got a few more in large intestines, surprisingly enough, when we start talking about carcinomas. Lyle Miles, there was a couple that were reported. Uh, I pulled these two case studies. They don't tell me anything because one was four months one was two years. So I guess the average is somewhere around a year. Um, no, don't do that. The, uh, the, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's just small number of cases. So surgery, doxorubicin-based therapy, but there was a long survivor there, and they used dox with that guy. Adenocarcinomas, there were two cases there that were treated. These were both dogs actually reported. They had their tumor removed, followed with docs, and those guys got 17 months each. So that's a pretty good number there in, in two, two separate cases. 
All right, last one. So we large intestine, cecum and colon. Um, going into large intestine, rare tumors. I couldn't really find a statistic on that one, uh, but just it is rare in dogs and in cats. Uh, similar to the small intestine in age, 6 to 10 years of age in, in our dogs, 10 to 12 years in cats, that's going to be the same, same as the small intestinal. Again, that male, male increase, so slight increase in male dogs. There's some overrepresentation among these breeds, and, and these three breeds probably have absolutely nothing in common. So German Shepherd, Collie, and Maltese. So this guy looks just like a German Shepherd over here. But, uh, but yeah, these, so, so those breeds have all been reported. Typically, those guys are reported with some of the more uh, you know, benign tumors like polyps. And that is going to be something that's a little bit interesting is because we see more of those lower grades in our pets uh, in, or in our patients, the dogs and cats. Limited number of risk factors, though, noted in dogs and cats, but in humans we see a ton of colorectal cancer, and so we know a lot about it. Colorectal cancer is one of the most common diagnosed cancers and one of the most fatal cancers in men and women every year. It's, it is a bad disease, and, and we see too much of it. Documented human risk are, uh, again, probably going to put me on a bad spot, but red meat, fried food, <laughs> low-fiber diets, high-fat diets, obesity, so... Zero fun all the way around. So, no, it's, it, it is. I mean, we see we see a lot of those links, fried foods and stuff. It, it certainly have been linked to it. There are also some hereditary and uh, and familial causes. The first one is the APC uh, gene. That's the adenomatous polypoiesis uh, coli gene. So. The APC gene is basically a mutated family trait that you can pick up and, and carry on in your, fa in your family that leads to the development of lower grade polyps. So that's a typically a gene when you have an APC gene that's going to mean somewhere down the road you may get some form of, of either uh, cobblestone or multifocal or, or isolated polyp formation in the colon and rectum. The HNPCC gene, though, is totally different. That's a hereditary non-polypoiesis colon cancer gene. That is a true colon cancer gene. That means that you are inherited a, a gene that links you to a higher grade, more aggressive type of colon cancer, and certainly that was the one that we don't like to find if, when they're testing for it. And they can evaluate for these genes now, and they are doing it more in certain families, just as we look for BRCA genes like breast cancer, uh, breast cancer genes. Unlike small intestinal and uh, small intestinal, most large intestinal tumors are, are fairly low grade. So the more aggressive ones are less likely in dogs and cats, and so we see more benign tumors. and And I use that term benign very, very loosely. It's it is truly more low grade. <clears throat> These are going to be more polyps, adenoma formation, um, carcinoma in situ. So carcinoma in situ is a precursor. Usually that's going to lead over or could potentially lead over to more malignant transformation. The more malignant tumors that we see, most common one in the dogs is adenocarcinoma. Most common one in the cat is lymphoma. So to recap, the stomach, small intestine, and large intestine, in a cat, it's super easy. Lymphoma, lymphoma, lymphoma. So that's going to be what you're seeing when you start, when, when you start finding tumors in cats. In dogs, it, it's a little bit different. Adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, adenocarcinoma. So it kind of gives you an idea at least what the most common things are. Lyomyos just have been in, uh, identified. The most common location now known in the dog for a gist formation, stromal tumor formation, is the cecum. So tumors in the cecum, we think just before anything else really now in dogs. Uh, carcinoids, neuroendocrine tumors can also be found in the large intestine. So here's a little picture of a, a colonoscopy, and that's got, uh, that's got the multifocal polyp type formation that you're seeing there. Polyps have more of a benign behavior. They do not metastasize in most, in most situations. They're more commonly found in the rectum versus the colon or the cecum. <clears throat> the uh, carcinomas in site two, again, they're a precursor. They can lead to a more malignant tumor formation. Um, they're found in both the rectum and the colon. The big thing about these is they can be solitary. That's the typical formation, but they also can have this jazz where you have just multiple locations throughout the whole colon. And that makes it real, real frustrating because now you're not able to go in there and locally excise those off. You have to pick out the ones that are more problematic. Maybe we're kind of moving forward and trying to do something a little more locally, pull the inflammation out, get these tumors to shrink down some. But, but you know, I do call them tumors, I mean, because they are problematic to some degree. But this is, this is the ones that are, that are harder to address. Uh, they also have a high incidence of reoccurrence, or if you have a big one, you have a high incidence to develop another one later in life if you're you know, a fellow young guy or, or a fairly young uh, uh, female. 
Adenocarcinomas of the large intestines, they are the most common um, aggressive, I guess, uh, aggressive malignant tumor in the dog. And so, as we said, that, that's going to be the most common one with lymphoma being the most common one in a cat. In dogs, it, the rectum is the most common site. They can have two or three different appearances. Uh, with carcinomas, you can have a nice little pedunculated one. It's towards the distal aspect of the rectum. It allows for that little rectal pull-through procedure you hear about us doing. Anesthetize a dog, able to avert a lot more colon and or a lot, excuse me, a lot more rectum out than what than what you think we would be able to, and we can remove that that tumor when it's pedunculated and invert that right back into the the dog. The cobblestone appearance and the annular appearance are more challenging. Those are usually going to be found further in, more middle rectum. That can be challenging because now that uh, may negate us doing the more rectal pull-through procedure and cause for a more intra-abdominal, even intra-pelvic type of procedure. Those are the real hard ones when we're trying to get in between that pelvis and, and cut notches and things like that to get to them. But <clears throat> cobblestone may certainly be that. You're seeing more of a cobblestone appearance annular are going to be more of a ring-like where you're starting to occlude and obstruct down the, uh, obstruct down the colon. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go back just a second here. So <clears throat> I don't think I put a slide in here that I was going to, but I'm going I'm to say this. This is, what, this, is, this is pedunculated versus cobblestone versus annular. This is why in most of these tumors, well, all of these tumors, when I identify them, I talk to owners about doing colonoscopies because you, you, we have a lot of these that end up going to surgery and just taking the mass out and saying, okay, you're good, go home. A lot of times that may be the right thing. It may be the only mass there. But as you saw in that last colonoscopy picture, I get some of these guys that come back. You know, they just had a surgery somewhere else. Maybe they're moving here. Um, you know, they, they, they've had one of these moved last year and they've got multiple ones in other areas in the intestine or in others of the colon, you're just not going to know they're there. So, so doing a colonoscopy prior to this procedure is really nice. Sometimes we'll, we'll coordinate that with surgery where we anesthetize them. We, we, well, first we give them a nice enema, get them all cleaned out for, for us, and when we go in, we do a colonoscopy, we get identified what we're dealing with, and then we move these guys into surgery. And if that's the only one we got, that's when we get. If it's not the only one we got, maybe we change our plan of attack for that surgery. But, but you know, I, I have to talk to owners about that. A lot of them don't want to do it, but it's important, as you guys know, to, to know, get all the cards on the table and know what we're truly dealing with. So I wanted to put that in there. At least I wanted to bring it up. Colonoscopy with surgery when you're seeing these are, are really important. Second most common feline colorectal tumor will be the carcinoma. Lymphoma is going to be the most common. It's a highly invasive tumor. And I'm gonna, this is going to be the trend here, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more here. But the, the, the trend is is that... Dogs seem to do better when we move from the small intestine to the colon. Cats seem to do a lot worse when we move from the small intestine to the colon. So colonic tumors, lymphomas, carcinomas, they start to have a worse prognosis when we move out of the small intestine and go into the, the colorectal large intestine. When we look at dogs, dogs are going to start picking up more benign tumors, polyps and, and site twos and, and bigger prognosises. Cats, if they go in and have a big carcinoma removed, they're going to have about a four and a half month survival time. That's going to be on average. We can see some pretty significant benefits, though, when they have these tumors removed um, with adenin doxorubicin. Again, here's an example where doxorubicin chemotherapy trumps carbo in, in the carcinoma side of things moving into the large intestine. So cats go from four and a half days with surgery alone for their carcinoma to 280 days when I add doxorubicin in or more. So you may double their survival time in some of these cases by adding in chemo. So really important there. Just as I told you earlier, this is all the stuff we've already talked about. Car uh, the zececum is the place we find it most. Highly cellular tumor, rise from these call cells, um, and uh, mutated C kit, as we said. Uh, you're distinguishing from Lyos, doing that CD117 stain. The uh, treatment rate we like to see, we like to use with some of these tumors after removal, or even some cases in place of removal, is going to be the Palladia, Kinevet, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The metastatic rate for these tumors in the cecum is much lower. Like I said, 33% in the stomach. When we get into the when you get into the cecum and we get into the large intestine, uh, with just this that metastatic rate drops down quite a bit. It drops down in that 15, 20% in, in some cases. We're using these tyrosine kinase inhibitors in place of surgery or we're using them where we're trying to prevent it from reoccurring. You know, you're, you're doing more of a minimal excision. Feline colorectal lymphoma versus small intestinal lymphoma. This is what I was saying where when you're a cat and you're moving into the, the large intestine, your prognosis starts dropping. 
lymphoma in a cat, when it moves into the large intestine, it'll drop from six, and a, six, six to nine months with large, uh, high grade, large cell lymphoma to maybe three and a half months. Uh, that, is, that is real. I mean, you will definitely see the, the prognosis be a little bit more challenged, a little bit more difficult to treat. Cats will have a, a few more issues, more chronic diarrhea. We don't see a lot of it. That's a good thing. We don't see a ton of, of large intestine uh, lymphoma in cats, but three and a half months was the reported prognosis there, four and a half months if they had adenocarcinoma. So we know that their prognosis kind of gets worse as it moves out of the small intestine. Whereas dogs, that three to six months that we're seeing in the small intestine, now when their lymphoma moves into the large intestine, unfortunately there's not a lot of publication, but I can tell you without a doubt with my clinical impression on this is that they will do much better when it's in the large intestine versus the small intestine. I've treated a lot of dogs with large intestinal lymphoma. Um, I've, I've seen several, and, and certainly when we treat them, I see an improved uh, response to chemotherapy. I certainly see less systemic involvement. I, I've had some of these dogs that have masses. I can palpate them, cobblestone appearance on rectal, or we pick it up on a, a mass effect on, the, on ultrasound. We start these guys on chemo, that really improves, goes down, and these guys do great. Now they may, and interestingly enough, they may relapse in their lymph nodes. I've definitely had that happen a couple times where they relapse looking like a normal multicentric lymph lymphadenopathy case, but most of these guys will do better. And the increased survival time, longest one I ever had, lived for three years with the disease. So I know, and, 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 and that's not normal. I mean, I definitely see some of them live out there 10 months, 12 months. So a prognosis is not necessarily three to six months when it's in the large intestine. I do see it. That, that the world gets a little better for dogs when their lymphoma is in the colon and rectum, whereas in the cat it may get a little bit worse. Surgery on the large, uh, large intestine tumors, again, low-grade polyps, adenomas, carcinoma, and site twos, we try to get them out of there. The localized obstructive malignant tumors like adenocarcinoma, lyomile sarcoma, or GIST, going in and doing a, a resection anastomosis for those to remove them can really be beneficial, and we can see a lot of, uh, of long-term control there. And if we're not able to remove them, at least we can get a biopsy and find out what we're dealing with and maybe pick out a good treatment plan for them with a, a chemotherapy approach. Chemotherapy, again, malignant, multifocal, diffuse, metastatic tumors, tumors that like to metastasize, those are the ones we're going after. And you're going to see with adenocarcinoma, again, improved response to doxorubicin. Uh, sometimes we will add carbo. I just I like doxorubicin for large intestinal uh, carcinomas. Lymphoma, same story, different part of the intestine. CHOP protocol, lamustine and pred. Stromal tumors, palladia and kinevet. So carcinomas in site two and, and rectal polyps, say so you've got that cobblestone multifocal appearance that we saw on the, on the colonoscopy earlier. What do you do with that? Peroxicam in humans and in dogs has been shown to significantly help these guys. In, in humans, they'll do it as a suppository. My, uh, my resident mate did a dog with a suppository for a while. She, she had one just to see if it would have any increased benefit. Uh, our, you know, is in a one, but we didn't really see a whole lot of benefit. It's a lot more logistically challenging, obviously, for the owner. So I usually just do the oral approach. Um, Proxicam will pull the inflammation out. It'll make a big difference. A lot of those dogs will benefit from it, so I do lean towards that. Maybe we do some, some ablation of some of the bigger masses that are maybe causing some issues, and then we'll put them on an inset to see if we can help out with it. High-dose chemo, probably not going to do a whole lot for a polyp or an insight too. It's just not having a high replication potential. It's not going to take that drug up. So going with more of a, a lower-grade chemo or even maybe a, or a, a inset or a lower-grade chemo like metronomic chemo that you and you've heard me talk about is probably a much better approach. So that's a crash course from the mouse to the rear end. So I hope uh, I hope you guys got something out of that. I mean, it, it's a it's a lot of information. Obviously, I tried to hit on a lot of big big topics and some and give you some ideas on on what to what to tell clients when you're faced with some of these tumors. And obviously. Please call me. You guys call me anytime. Please call me anytime you have any of these tumors. I'll be happy to help you work through them and, and figure out a good game plan for them. And thank you again for coming out. Appreciate it.